Our first plenary speaker comes from this background and represents the new generation of imaging scientists. In spite of her being in the early stage of her career, she clearly belongs on this podium and does not need much introduction. You have all seen her name and face in news last year in April when the first image of a black hole was made public. It is my great pleasure to welcome among us Dr. Katie Bowman. Wow, I was um, not expecting that. So thank you so much for the incredibly kind introduction. I'm honored to be here today at the conference, and I'm excited to be a part of it. So many things that we want to take pictures of, we can actually see with our own eyes. And, and using a standard camera, we can take a picture. That picture might be blurrier or noisier than we like, but it's still roughly the scene that we can see with our eyes. But in many cases, what we want to take a picture of, of is actually invisible to us. So for instance, we can't use that standard camera to take a picture of our brain. And in these cases, it's impossible to directly see the things we want to see. And so we have to come up with unique ways of, of recovering that picture. Um, for instance, by developing unconventional sensing systems that make measurements that don't look anything like the image that we, the, our target image, but by developing algorithms that understand that sensing system and, and work with it, we can develop ways to recover the image back from these um, measurements. And so by collaboratively designing a novel um, sensing systems and algorithms that work together, we're able to push past fundamental um, limitations of imaging methods in order to see things that were pre previously considered Im uh, impossible to see or measure. And so using this methodology, I've worked on developing a number of ways to uncover um, different kinds of um, images or measure things that you can't uh, measure with traditional sensors. For instance, seeing behind corners, recovering material properties. But today, today I want to talk mostly about how a group of, of uh, hundreds of astronomers, physicists, mathematicians, and engineers from around the world came together to develop an Earth-sized telescope and its algorithms in order to take the first image of a black hole. And in designing these algorithms, how we are now developing new ideas in machine learning in, either, in order to push this even further in order to see things that are even currently still invisible to us. So black holes are one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're cloaked by an event horizon where extreme gravity prevents light from escaping them. Yet the matter that falls onto a black hole is superheated to hundreds of billions of degrees so that before it passes through that boundary, it actually shines very brightly. And for that reason, although black holes are relatively compact, they actually can often outshine the combined starlight of all the stars in their host galaxies. And so scientists have been studying black holes ever for, since they were first predicted from Einstein's theory of general relativity just over 100 years ago. And in particular, for decades, scientists have been studying the giant elliptical galaxy at the he head of the Virgo constellation. So this galaxy um, is called M87, and it's very special. It's 55 million light years away from us, and many years ago, someone discovered a streak of light on the sky that ended up being a, a galactic jet of a plasma that was shooting out of the core of the galaxy and marking the spot of a supermassive black hole. And so for decades, scientists built better and better instruments in order to try to study this galactic scale jet and the tiny black hole at its core. And then in 2017, we hooked up an Earth-sized telescope and took the first data that we needed to, after two years, make the first image of a black hole. But you may ask, how are we able to take a picture of something that kind of by definition should be unseeable? Well, light propagating near a black hole doesn't follow straight lines. It actually is curved because the black hole is curving the space-time around it. So the light can even go in complete circles around the black hole. And so as I said, you have all this gas flowing around the black hole. It's superheated, so you have photons flying around everywhere. And some of these photons fall into the black hole, but other ones just graze it so that they're bent around. And the net effect is essentially that the black hole casts a shadow on a backdrop of bright, bright material that's almost per perfectly circular. So it's not, in effect, we're not seeing the black hole itself, but the imprint of the black hole. And if Einstein was right about general relativity, then this light would be bent into a ring whose, uh, whose size and shape tells us about the mass and the spin of the black hole. And this is often referred to as the black hole shadow. 
So simulations of the turbulent plasma in the jets and in the accretion disk around the black hole predict that if we were able to see at about a one millimeter wavelength and we had infinite resolution of basic glasses, we might expect to see something like this around the black hole. And so today I want to tell you about how we were able to take a picture of a black hole, how did we verify what we recovered, and how are we pushing forward to the next generation of the telescope to see even more. So what makes this so hard? Well, as I said, M87, it's really, really far away from us, 55 million light years. So that means that the black hole is really small in the sky. And even with the Hubble telescope, we can barely make out the galactic scale jet that's shooting out of it. And so seeing the black hole shadow requires a very particular type of telescope, one that's observing at just the right wavelength and it's just the right size. And so at too short of wavelengths, like optical wavelengths that the Hubble telescope is seeing here, you actually can't, um, the galactic dust um, actually blocks us from seeing the light within it, within. And similarly, at longer wavelengths, gas shrouds the black hole and is blocking the light from within. So for instance, this is a, a simulation of a black hole done at a three millimeter wavelength. And at this wavelength, you, you can't see that black hole shadow because all the gas around it is blocking. But as you go to a shorter and shorter wavelength, this gas actually um, becomes more optically thin and it peels away until you're left with that ring right around the black hole's event horizon. But even if we were able to successfully observe at this around one millimeter wavelength, taking the picture would still be really difficult. And that's because this ring is incredibly small. It's about 40 micro arc seconds in size, which is about the same size as a grain of sand. But when that grain of sand is in New York, New York and we're viewing it from here in California. And, and so why is taking a picture of something that small so hard? Well, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Well, it all comes down to diffraction, which tells us the smallest things that we can resolve given a certain uh, telescope size and, and uh, wavelength of light that we're observing. So if you plug the necessary wavelength and angular resolution that we need to see that black hole into the diffraction limit equation, you can easily calculate in order to see the black hole, we would need to build a telescope that's 13 million meters across, or roughly the size of the Earth. And if we could build that Earth-sized telescope, we could just start to make out the distinctive ring of light that's indicative of the black hole's event horizon. OK, obviously building a single dish telescope the size of the Earth isn't possible. But, um, but by combining telescopes from around the world, I've been working as part of an international collaboration an international collaboration called the Event Horizon Telescope that built the first computational telescope that's the size of the Earth that was capable of resolving structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon for the very first time. And joining telescopes in this manner is called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, or VLBI. So how does VLBI work? Well, we actually have telescopes um, distributed all around the world. These telescopes were originally built for other purposes, but by, uh, by installing special purpose um, equipment in each of the telescopes, we can actually freeze the light at each location, recording the light with information about the precise timing using atomic clocks, and then we bring this data together and use our computers to act like the lens to make the picture. But how, once we bring it all together, what information are we getting? OK, well, unlike with a camera, in the Event Horizon Telescope and Very Long Baseline Interferometry, we don't take a picture of the image, in, uh, we don't take measurements of the image in pixel space, but we instead take measurements in its frequency space. So we essentially take measurements of the black hole image's Fourier transform. And if we covered the Earth in telescopes, so if, we, if we tiled it in telescopes, we would sample all these spatial frequency measurements. But because we only have a small number of measurements, it turns out that for every two telescopes in the telescope array, we get a single measurement of the underlying image's 2D spatial frequency related to the projected baseline between the telescopes. So each of these measurements that we make, remember, it's a point in the um, um, complex spatial frequency plane, so it's going to have an amplitude and a phase. OK, but in 2017, we had eight different telescopes that were uh, located around the globe, but actually only five of them were at different locations and could see the black hole in M87. So that would be only five choose two. That'd only be 10 measurements that we'd have to use to try to recover a, an image from. But luckily, we get more. So as the Earth is rotating, the, the, um, we actually get new measurements. So since the projected baselines between telescopes change as the Earth rotates, 
This amounts to carving out different elliptical paths in the spatial frequency plane, where points, where telescopes that are close together correspond to sh shorter baselines. So you're going to get um, that's going to be low spatial frequency. So you're going to get broad structure. So to get the high spatial frequency, you need to see the uh, the the ring. You need to put your telescopes far apart as possible. Okay, so we get all these measurements from the different telescopes, it actually turns out we, that we collect a lot of data. So from each telescope, uh, uh, we get uh, about a half a petabyte of data, actually a little bit more than a half a petabyte of data. So here's my friend Lindy Blackburn posing with about half the data that we got from the LMT telescope in Mexico. And so overall in 2017, we collected about five petabytes of data. And it's so much that we actually can't send it over the internet. We have to f we use the highest bandwidth we can by sending it on planes. And we get it to a, and we bring it all to a common location. And you can see here at the bottom is these stacks, all these kind of um, uh, racks of, of hard drives that we have. And at that common location, we use a special purpose supercomputer called a correlator to combine the signals using the precisely time uh, information from the atomic clock and also GPS. And, but once this is done, we kind of get some sort of data, but the signal to noise ratio is still not super high, so we go through another stage called calibration, which tunes parameters in it to, um, to extract higher signal to noise ratio measurements from the data. And so at the beginning, we have five petabytes of data, and by the end, after calibration, we actually have megabytes, our files are just megabytes, and you can email them to each other. And so although we collect lots of data, there's very little information in that data. And I also just want to highlight here a, a number of people who made this possible. So Lindy Blackburn here led the calibration effort designing algorithms um, that were specific to the EHT data in order to get higher uh, signal-to-noise uh, ratio measurements that we could use for imaging. And I also want to highlight C.K. Machek, Sarah, and Michael, along with others who really helped in this effort. Without getting this good data, we wouldn't have been able to make images. But once we have this data, then how do we make the picture? How do we use the, the, um, the algorithms to make a picture? Okay, so at this point we have the data, and we can kind of abstract away all the astrophysics of the problem. So we have these sparse measurements that our goal is to try to find the image that caused them. And again, if we had all these spatial frequency measurements and our data had no noise, it would be simple. We'd just take an inverse Fourier transform to get an image. But since we only see a few samples, then there are thus an infinite number of possible images that are perfectly consistent with the data that we measure. And on top of that, the fact that there's a quickly changing atmosphere above each of the telescopes that's different makes the, our measurements incredibly noisy. And I just want to give you an idea of the kind of noise that we, and the difficulty we have due to this atmospheric noise. So the whole idea, the whole reason interferometry works in the first place is due to the fact that light from the black hole is going to travel to light to Earth for 55 million years. And when it reaches Earth, it's going to hit one of the telescopes um, slightly before the other one. And that time delay is key for extracting the 2D spatial frequency measurement that we use for image reconstruction. But when you have a different a telescope in Hawaii and one in Spain and one in Chile, they all have different atmospheres above each other, above them, and that introduces an additional propagation delay into the signal that actually completely scrambles our phase measurement. And on top of that, the, this atmospheric phase error also changes, uh, causes a change in the gain of the measurements, which causes a change in the absolute amplitude. So this error is really challenging. So ideally, we would measure this nice, beautiful, complex com um, frequency component, italicized B, but in reality, our atmosphere first rotates our measurement to some random number, to, to some random phase, and then scales it. And so the measurement that we get out in the end doesn't look, that we, rec that we collect, doesn't look anything like the ideal measurement. And so that's pretty terrible, because at first glance, we've lost both our amplitude and our phase. So if you've lost both of them, what really kind of do you have left? But, um, but luckily, there's a lot of structure in this noise. So ideally, you know, we measured this Fourier component. Um, remember, the, each component that we measure is the, from the combination of two telescopes. Two telescopes give us one measurement. And these errors that we have, they're site-based. So they're dependent only on each telescope. And so if we replace, for instance, telescope one with telescope three, we're going to get a different measurement, the measurement between telescope three and two. But notice that it shares some of the same corrupting terms, G2 and Phi2. 
And so we can take advantage of this redundant uh, corruption while solving for our images. And so to do this, we developed two classes of imaging algorithms to tackle the problem. The first class of algorithms is actually based on very standard methods that were developed in the radio astronomy community uh, a long time ago, and, um, but they were originally developed for telescope arrays that were operating at longer wavelengths and had many more telescopes in them. So the big advantage of these methods is they're very standard in the community, and so the community un, uh, accepts them and understands them. But the big disadvantage is because they were not originally built for this purpose, a lot of times you need a lot of guidance from a knowledge knowledgeable user in order to um, lead it in a direction to get a reasonable image. But still, because it is a standard method, it is really important that we got these methods working on the data. And so I just want to highlight Jose J. Young, Thomas Allen, Svetlana, and Shoko, along with others who made it possible to use these methods, um, um, modified them for this challenging data. But then another set of methods, a uh, class of methods that we've been developing more um, recently, um, we call, and this is what I've been doing along with Michael Johnson, Andrew uh, Shale, and Kazu Akiyama, is developing more Bayesian um, style methods or regularized maximum likelihood approaches to deal with these, this kind of um, event horizon telescope data. And in this method, we don't try to find an inverse function that takes us directly from the data to an image, but instead we try to say, let's find an image that when you pass it through the forward model of the telescope system, you, get me you would get measurements that look like the data that we see. And, and by adding a, 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 regularize, a regularization or a prior term, we can choose among the infinite images um, that, uh, that are reasonable. And so the big disadvantage of these methods is that we have to define what is a reasonable, what is a good looking image through the image regularizer or a prior, and how do you define something, if something is a good image, especially an image of a black hole that you've never seen before. But the big advantage of these methods is that we can naturally incorporate all these different types of air that we expect to see um, in, um, on the Event Horizon Telescope data into our model, and so we can naturally deal with the, the, the issues that come up from them. And so, for instance, we can directly optimize with constraints that are insensitive to that atmospheric air that I talked about earlier. And we do that through optimizing on constraints known as, known as closure quantities. And I'm not going to go into detail about what these are, but I kind of just want to give you a hint. So remember, for every two, measurement, every two telescopes, we get a measurement. It's going to have amplitude and phase. So if you multiply the measurements from uh, three telescopes in a closed loop, you're going to add their phases. And it turns out that the air due to the atmosphere actually cancels out completely, and you're left with a term that is the same as if you had no atmospheric air whatsoever. And similarly, in a term called closure amplitude, if you multiply and divide the measurements in a certain order, you cancel out those uh, gain errors, and you're left with a term that's the same as if the gains were all one. And so the advantage of these is that we, can, we don't have to deal with all that crazy atmospheric noise. The disadvantage, obviously, is that it's a much more complicated uh, uh, function of the image that we have to try to optimize. Um, and just to give you a, a, a little bit of a, a better sense of how we do it, okay, so we have some proposed reconstruction x hat. We pass it through the forward model of the telescope system to get the expected robust data products uh, y hat that we would expect to see if x hat was the true image. And then we compare it to the actual noisy measurements through the data likelihood. Um, and through this, by, um, we can make this data likelihood invariant to atmospheric air and also incorporate a, a lot of other types of air that we expect to see on the um, measurements from the Event Horizon Telescope. But still, there's going to be an infinite number of images that still give you the exact same y hat. So to choose among them, we use a, a prior uh, or a image regularizer that allows us to score these images and choose the one that we think is most likely to go from the infinite number of images to one that we think um, both explains the data well and, it, it, and is a likely image. But no, OK, in this method, as, as is the case with any method that you're going to come up with to deal with this kind of sparse data, we have to inject some information into the problem about what images look like in order to recover anything back in the end. And so that's uh, difficult because uh, what, well, we don't want to accidentally, for instance, inject information that the black hole looks like a ring and then be super excited that we get a ring back in the end. So we had to be really careful when um, imaging uh, this black hole data for the first time. 
And so the big question we faced in dealing with M87 is not just how do you reconstruct an image, but also how do we make sure that what we're reconstructing is actually real? And so we've tackled this through a multi-step process. The first step actually began years before we even collected the data of the black hole, and that was to run synthetic data tests. And we did this through what were called the Event Horizon Telescope Imaging Challenges. And in these challenges, we'd take a team of people, they would select some image, and they would um, generate synthetic data as if the black hole looked like that image on the sky. And they'd add in all this kind of crazy kind, t kinds of noise and air that we expect to see on measurements. And then they would make this data publicly available without telling any knowledge of what the true image is. And then teams of people would use their favorite methods to make a guess at what they thought the underlying image looked like. And these images were passed off to a team of experts who then took a look at these images and said, oh, do I believe what I'm seeing? What don't I believe? What scientific um, conclusions could I, come, um, uh, uh, could I make from them? And this is very similar to what we'd actually have to do with the actual Event Horizon Telescope data, because we don't know what the black hole looks like. So we'd, from these reconstructions, we'd have to come to some conclusions of what do we believe is the underlying structure. But unlike the real data, we actually do have the true image, so we can compare it to it in the end. So I want to just show you a few examples of things we saw in these challenges and, how, and what we learned from them to, to, to kind of motivate how we went forward with the actual M87 data. So here's one example. On the top is the true image, and then on the, to the right of it is it blurred to the resolution that we could hope to achieve. Um, and then on the bottom are five methods that were submitted. They had no knowledge of the true image at the time. And um, one thing you'll notice is that all the images, they look slightly different from each other. But still, there's a lot of commonality between them. They all kind of look like this crescent shape that's brighter on the left side than the right side. But there are differences among them, too, and especially in the kinds of wispy structures that come off it or this tail coming off the bottom left. And by seeing what is, cons what is common across the reconstructions and not common, you can try to build up confidence in certain features and, try to, and, and po potentially reject other ones. But we didn't want to just test our things on things that we expect to see, like black hole looking structures. So we occasionally threw in random things to, to keep everyone on their toes. For instance, uh, this was one of the um, challenges we had too. We did around the holidays. <laughs> and the reason I liked the, this example is because no one was expecting to have a snowman in the center of the galaxy. No methods were expecting this. They're, you know, you're not training on anything like this. And it gave us confidence that you know, all the reconstructions kind of still looks frosty-ish. And so um, it gave us confidence that we'd be able to see something surprising in our real data, although maybe your, interp your physical interpretation of what you're seeing is a little off. Um, so from this, we then uh, kind of decided how we were going to go about dealing with the actual M87 data. So based on these synthetic data tests, we developed how we were going to approach it, and we wanted to avoid shared human bias like we had done in these imaging challenges in order to uh, assess common features among independent reconstructions. And so to do that, we split about 40 people, 40 people who either develop methods or they're just good, at, they have a lot of experience using these methods. They were split into four teams that span the Earth. And when uh, the data was released to them, they were told, go off into your rooms. We were told, go off into your rooms and re make your best images from the data, but don't talk to each other. So we w worked in isolation for seven weeks, making our best images uh, our, our, uh, from the data and trying to understand it. And then after seven weeks, we all gathered together in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and revealed the images to each other. And this is what we saw. So this was actually quite amazing. Uh, although each picture was different, just like they were in the imaging challenges, there's still common uh, features among them. So for instance, they all had a ring of roughly 40 micro arc seconds in size that was brighter on the bottom than the top. And so seeing these images was actually one of the happiest moments I had in the collaboration, because although I'd been able to reconstruct an image using my favorite methods um, before that, it wasn't until I saw that different people using different methods that had different biases in them all reconstructed a very similar underlying structure that we really started to believe what we were seeing. But still, we wanted to make sure that we weren't imposing some sort of human bias. Um, for instance, we could have all still wanted to see that ring structure. And so we spent the next couple of months essentially trying to break these images. 
And that led to our, the third step, where we tried to objectively choose human, uh, imaging parameters to remove humans from the loop as much as possible. And so to do this, we developed three different imaging pipelines. You can develop, uh, you can download all this code and the data online and make your own images, make better images, um, please. And, um, but all of these methods all have some sort of hyperparameters associated with them that are usually tuned by a human user. But instead of having a human tune these parameters, we instead wanted to search for this best set of parameters to recover different types of source structures. So for instance, uh, we generate in synthetic data as if the Event Horizon Telescope were seeing a disk on the sky that had no hole in the center, generated uh, synthetic data of that, and then tried to tune the, the parameters of the imaging method to best recover that disk shape without, a, that you know, had no hole and looked as much like the disk as possible. And then we would transfer these parameters onto the actual M87 data, and we found although we had tried our hardest to find parameters that would recover a disk, our data required us to put a hole in the center. And so by doing this simple training and testing procedure on many different types of source structures, uh, we saw that our method always preferred this ring shape, and that was true no matter the day that we observed M87 on or the type of code or the code that we used to reconstruct it. And so by blurring the images from different imaging pipelines to a consistent resolution, we then averaged them together to form the image that we showed um, to everyone last April. This ring of roughly 40 micro arc seconds that's brighter on the bottom than the top, top and shown at a, basically features that we really trust in our images. So once we had made these images, we still wanted to make sure that they were right. So we went through a number of validation tests uh, we did a number of these. I'm only going to talk briefly about two of them today. Um, and the first one is uh, just uh, basically on how, how should we go about identifying variations in these images. So remember before I said we came up with a set of beta parameters, those knobs that we set to recover different, um, to, to, that we use to, um, as input to the imaging methods. But really, you know, why should one set of imaging parameters be better than the others? Actually, by running synthetic data tests, you can easily see that there's actually a lot of parameters that perform reasonably well on synthetic data. So instead of just setting one, we set some sort of bar and found all the imaging parameters that, would, um, that performed well on the synthetic data, and then transferred those all to the M87 data to see the variations that we would recover from assuming different types of imaging models. And so for instance, here is showing a slice of two of the parameters that we searched over with the green boxes highlighting the images that we found performed well in synthetic data. And then, um, so one for the EHT imaging survey that I show here, we ran hundreds of thousands of different simulations and found about 1,500 parameters that performed well. And so then we could align these 1,500 images um, and look at variations across them. So here, for instance, in the middle, I'm showing the standard deviation of the, of the images. And you can see that there is a, a variation in the standard deviation over the ring structure. Um, and this is due to the interplay between the source structure and the point spread function of the telescope array. Um, but if you notice, the, the standard deviation is actually very small compared to the, how, how bright that ring is in the, to begin with. So if you take the fractional standard deviation, you'll notice that that ring we believe a lot, um, but all that wispy structure on the outside we don't believe, so don't trust that. And then the last thing I'll talk about is model fitting. And this was on its own a 50 page paper, but I, so I'm not gonna do it justice with two slides, but I think it's important to highlight that this is another way that we can verify what we're seeing in these images. So once we had these, for instance, 1500 images that we um, had recovered from different kinds of imaging models, we could look across them for uh, low level features. For instance, we could, we could extract the diameter of the ring from each of these images and see how it varied from, um, from different days, from different methods, different imaging models. And we saw that when we did this, we all recovered uh, a, a consistent diameter of about 40, 42 micro arc seconds for that ring size. <clears throat> 
but we really don't need to just recover the ring uh, just from images. We could do simple model fitting. So we also developed MCMC style methods um, that allowed us, or sampling methods that allowed us to look over um, simple st source structures, for instance, crescent models, to find um, the best set of, um, of low dimensional models that fit the data. And even doing this, we could um, get very good fits um, with a uh, diameter of about 40 to 42 micro arc seconds for the ring size. So one theme that I hope uh, you've picked up on is that every step of this process, from taking the petabytes of data, reducing it down, um, doing the imaging and modeling, we actually had independent um, pipelines, independent techniques that we, ha that we developed for each of these stages. And that's because when we're using this computational telescope for the very first time, we don't have a way to just point it at something and verify that what we're doing is, is correct. And so we wanted to make sure we didn't propagate errors down the, uh, down the line, and so we had to check every step of the process multiple times. But one question you might have is once we had gotten this image, well, what can we do with it? What do we learn? So for instance, one question you might have is, did we prove Einstein was right? And well, the short answer is no, but we also didn't prove he was wrong, which is actually a big deal too. Um, and so I just wanna explain how we can use this image to tell us a little bit about black holes and our uh, understanding of gravity. So if you take a fixed size mask, mass, you can actually calculate the radius that you need to compress it down into to get a black hole. And so for a short shield black hole, one that's non-spinning, this would actually be its event horizon. Um, but actually what we expect to see is not the event horizon itself, but instead the location of where photons are orbiting around, that, around the event horizon, called the photon orbit, which is a little larger than that. But actually that's not even what we see, because as the photons fly off of this photon orbit and come towards us, they're actually lensed even um, out to a larger radius. And so this is what we'd expect to see, a ring of roughly 5.2 times that short shell radius uh, for, uh, for a, a for a black hole that's non-spinning, or 5.2 times the event horizon. And for a maximally spinning black hole, about a it gets pulled in a little bit, so it's a, just a slightly smaller uh, radius, but 4.8 times that short shell radius. So this is the range of diameters you'd expect to see for a, uh, a black hole obey obeying canonical general relativity. But notice that this is actually, this ring size is directly dependent on the mass of the black hole. So for instance, if you have a black hole that uh, is not as heavy, then that um, ring is gonna be smaller. And so that's actually interesting because before the Event Horizon Telescope measurement, it was unclear what the mass of, black, of M87 was. Uh, gas dynamics pointed towards a number of about three and a half billion solar masses, while stellar dynamics pointed to a value of about six and a half billion Solar, um, um, solar masses, and really the black hole, um, the stellar dynamics, the one shown in yellow, um, gave an upper bound to how big that ring could be, because you couldn't have more mass from the black hole within the stellar orbits. But then we can ask, okay, how do we turn this into a test of black holes itself? Well, actually, we can look at other unusual and exotic objects, for instance, wormholes also produce shadow features, but for the same mass um, size wormhole, actually you're gonna get a smaller shadow size. And there's also things called naked singularities or super spinning black holes, but they even produce smaller shadows. And it turns out when you lay the Event Horizon Telescope image on top of them all, you instantly rule out all these other exotic possibilities, and you're left with a ring size that matches nearly perfectly with the stellar dynamic measurement that we got for canonical general relativity. But what is the exact mass? This is well, remember, you can, you can write down an equation of what the diameter should be of that photon orbit for a particular size mass black hole. But remember, this is for that particular orbit, the photon ring size. And if you look at a bunch of simulations, you might notice that sometimes the, the um, emission around the black hole is actually coming from the gas around it rather than that very particular uh, photon ring. And so groups at Radboud, UIUC, Frankfurt, Harvard, Harvard and Perimeter all got together and made this huge gigantic um, library of simulations that we could then try to calibrate our mass measurement to. So for instance, we take these simulations, um, extract data, um, synthetic data from them, and then do our feature extraction methods in which we would come up with a ring diameter that we could ca then calibrate to the true mass over diameter value. 
And so by applying this calibration to each of the different ways that we recover images, whether it's from fitting um, very simple crescent models, doing image domain feature extraction, or even just fitting those, those uh, black hole simulations directly to the data itself, we found that there was a consistent uh, mass of around that 6.5 billion um, solar masses that was uh, consistent with the stellar dynamics measurement. So I just want to highlight a, a couple of people, Avery Broderick, uh, Paul T uh, Teed, uh, Dom Pesci, Dom, uh, Jason Dexter, and Ferry Ozell, who really made it possible to do this kind of analysis of the mass and um, the consistency across different um, analysis methods. So this is just one of the things, though, that we can learn about black holes and gravity by studying this image. But perhaps the most amazing is that by comparing this uh, image to simulations scientists have made for years, we find that the image is amazingly consistent with a number of the predictions. And so by studying this image, we have the best evidence yet that black holes exist, as, way as, uh, as well as a way to learn about the immediate environment around a black hole, how black holes accrete matter, how they launch jets. Um, so really, we're just at the beginning, though. Now that we have the extreme laboratory of gravity, we can go back and we can say, how can we improve our algorithms? How can we improve, improve our instrument to learn even more? And so just uh, last month, we all gathered in Hawaii, not just to discuss the next set of results that we're pushing on, but also to th think about the future of the project, thinking about the next generation of the telescope and what we can actually do with it. So in 2017, we observed with telescopes at only six different locations. And so making images was quite challenging with that small number of measurements. But what could we do if we added, maybe, oh. What could we do if we added 10 more? Well, we might be able to sharpen up our image of MA7. We'll definitely be able to reduce our uncertainty. And maybe we'll even be able to capture a video of the black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, which evolves on the order of just minutes. Gas is spinning around it so quickly. And so over the course of a night, we would want to be able to recover not just a static image, but actually a video as the gas is moving towards its event horizon. And so being able to do these things would be a huge scientific gold mine. But before we just plop down a bunch of telescopes, we need to be really careful. Every telescope we put down is going to be millions, tens of millions of dollars. And so we have to be really careful about where we put those telescopes, where are we going to get our biggest bang for our buck. And so, so how, should, how did we previously optimize for the positions of the telescopes? Well, really, we, we knew roughly what the size of the source we were looking at was. So we chose telescopes that were far enough apart that we would measure those spatial frequency measurements. But it was really about where was our opportunity? Where were there telescopes already that we could put in hardware? Um, in hardware? But ideally, when you're, um, we should be designing the imaging algorithms with the location of these telescopes. So as we move, go forward, let's, let's think about where the best place of those telescopes should be. And oftentimes, people, when they're doing some sort of optimization, sensor optimization, you might go to something like compressed sensing that tells you how you might want to place your measurements. But these oftentimes are ignoring, uh, ignoring noise or complicated correlations and nonlinearities in the data. And so especially when our data is so correlated and so messy, it's, uh, it's a missed opportunity not to, direct, not to consider them. And so what, what we are really hoping to do is to try to optimize the location of the telescopes at the same time as developing those imaging algorithms. These two problems are intimately related. Existing imaging algorithms tell us where should we put telescopes to take best advantage of those algorithms, but also the location where we put al uh, telescopes tells us how we should design those algorithms. And so how should we go about solving this? Well, if you rearrange the blocks in the diagram, you're gonna, you'll notice that it looks very much like uh, a similar to an autoencoder. So in analogous in many computational imaging systems, an autoencoder tries to find a small set of, of codes that, is, um, that, tr that you can use to recover the input data from. And so deep autoencoders, where the encoder and decoder are both neural networks, have been used for a lot for image compression and have been um, done a, a really amazing job at being able to find an optimal function to compress your image down into um, that you can then recover the exact structure back in the end. <laughs> 
So one thing that we can do is in the reconstruction problem, we can think about uh, uh, how our encoder, in this case, is like uh, the sensing system, the telescope array, and our decoder is like the reconstruction method. But in, uh, unlike in a normal autoencoder, or, or like in a normal autoencoder, that decoder, that reconstruction method, can be some arbitrary function. We're just taking data and we're trying to recover what image would produce that data, and so we, could, we, can, um, we can plug in a, a, a deep neural network there, but what we can't do is just plug in a deep neural network for the encoder because it needs to be constrained by the possible set of sensor designs. It has to have some sort of physical constraints that go along with it. And so I've recently been working on this problem at Caltech um, with uh, Hassan, who is here in the audience, who is really leading this effort. And the approach that we propose is to model both the encoder and the decoder as a deep uh, neural network, but constrain the encoder architecture to be sampling from a set of possible physical sensor designs. So let's zoom into this encoder. So from some sort of input image, we can define a forward model um, that produces measurements that we might expect to see if we um, observed image Z here. And we could just pass all these possible samples off to um, the decoder, the reconstruction method, but we really want to choose among them which, which set of telescopes allow us to see them, um, uh, get the best reconstruction with the smallest number of telescopes. So instead, our goal is to actually introduce a sensor sampling distribution that characterizes the probability that we would sample from a particular telescope. So for instance, let's say we have t three telescopes here, telescope one, two, and three. Our measurements that we make come from the pairs of telescopes. So you can see their color, their, these are little dots color-coded with the color of the two telescopes. And we want to basically solve for the probability that we sample from the dis different telescopes here. So let's, for instance, say we sample telescope one and three. This will mask out some of the measurements that we've made, and only those measurements will be passed on to the image reconstruction decoder. And we can sample, every time we sample from this probability distribution, we may sample different combinations of telescopes. So ultimately, our goal is to design, uh, is to use this design to learn the optimal uh, a distribution of telescopes, the sam sampling of the distribution of telescopes that would allow us to every time reconstruct a reasonable image. And to do this, we, um, we modeled the uh, distribution as an uh, icing model um, in order to have a binary uh, uh, representation of um, sampling each telescope. So this process of choosing samples from a potential um, set of measurements we call a, a physics-motivated encoder. And in this example, we, uh, we talk about it in terms of sem sensors of uh, samples of a telescope, but really you could plug in any forward model here uh, in order and do the optimization. And so every time we're gonna sample a subset of these possible measurements, and then those measurements are gonna go on to the decoder to recover the image from them. And so we can string this all together into one large um, neural network and solve for the optimal sensing sampling distribution at the same size of the uh, reconstruction decoder network. And so by maximizing the similarity between the input and output images, the sensor sparsity to reduce the number of telescopes, and the diversity of the sampling strategy, we can solve for a, 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 a sensing sampling distribution that produces good results um, Whenever you, re, um, whenever you sample from measurements from it. And we learn this distribution through end-to-end -end training. So from this, we can come up with some sort of sampling policies that when we feed those measurements through the learned decoder, it's able to recover different images. But the real goal of this method is not to come up with the reconstruction method, but actually to characterize the optimal sampling pattern. And so as I mentioned earlier, we actually recover um, an uh, icing model that captures how often we should sample each of those telescopes along with how those t measurements are correlated. So for instance, on the right, it's showing the site correlation where blue says if you sample one of the telescopes, you don't want to sample the other one, and red says you always want to sample them together or not sample them together. And so for, by looking at what we've learned from these, you can often see a lot of, um, see a lot of patterns of what, how we should design our array. So for instance, here's something that is maybe obvious, but when you have two telescopes at the exact same location, you're gonna sample the same baselines. And so we actually find that you don't, when you sample one telescope at one location, you don't wanna sample a telescope at the exact same location.
Another thing we can see is see how the telescope um, a sensing strategy um, changes depending on the resolution that we require. So for instance, we can change the target resolution of the results um, from some sort of high super resolution to only moderate resolution and see how the activity of what sites we would like to sample from changes. So for instance, the South Pole Telescope shown in the black line here samples very long baselines, so that's high spatial frequencies, and we see that as we push it to higher and higher resolution that we'd like to recover from our images, it, 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 uh, it often samples that telescope more often. But one of the things that I really like about this is that it allows us to quantitatively measure basically how we should sample in the case of you having like complicated noise, nonlinearity, something where it's very hard to analytically write down how you should, how you should optimally sample. And so for instance, this is a result with purely Gaussian noise added onto the measurements, but we can easily add in all that really corrupting atmospheric phase air, and we can see that this changes our sen sensor sampling distribution. So as I go back and forth, you can see there are changes in, in, in what it ideally would like, telescopes it would like to sample. We can also see how this array design changes based upon the, the source that we would like to optimize for. So for instance, whether we want to look at the black hole in the M87 galaxy or Sag A star, the black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. And lastly, we can also see how we can investigate uh, which new site would be optimal to add to the current telescope array. So for instance, we can run a conditional, uh, we can uh, calculate the conditional distribution, and we find in this example that the DRAK telescope in um, southern Africa actually um, gives the most information, uh, additional information into our reconstruction problem. But of course we would need to do uh, a lot of additional analysis and um, more complete models before making any final uh, uh, decisions on where would the optimal location be. And so using this approach, we started to understand where we maybe want to put our next ground-based telescope uh, in order to reveal more of this unseen. And also what I'm really excited about is thinking about how we can also identify the, low, uh, the optimal orbits of telescopes in space to allow us to reconstruct even better. And, uh, and hopefully by joining our optimization, um, sensing, by s optimizing both the sensing system and the image reconstruction method jointly, we can solve for not only a better image of a black hole, but eventually even evolving movie of a black hole as the gas is slowly moving towards its event horizon. So with that, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.